The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art research laboratory that allows scientific research to be performed in the microgravity of space. Research in this unique microgravity environment is advancing our knowledge of biology, chemistry, physics, and physiology. Scientists from all over the world are using facilities on this high-flying international laboratory that is packed with some of the most sophisticated technologies ever designed. Space Station research brings new discoveries, furthers technology development, expands our limits of exploration, and improves our way of life on Earth. Hi, I'm Mark Gott. I work here at the Johnson Space Center in the Microbiology Lab. Our job in the Microbiology Lab is to protect the crew from possible problems that could occur due to microorganisms. So we take a look at the environment, the crew themselves, and the food they eat just to make sure that they're safe during a mission. We know a lot about what goes on in space flight. With the International Space Station, we've learned a tremendous amount about how the crew responds, what it takes to keep them healthy, and what kind of problems you have in the environment that may occur over time. However, we haven't always known a lot, and we still have a lot of questions to ask. That's why we do a lot of research. One of the challenges we face with astronauts in spaceflight is that we've found with some of our research that their immune system is regulated in a different way, and we're worried it could be dysfunctional. What does this mean? it's possible that the crew could be more susceptible to infectious disease. Good morning. My name is Dr. Cheryl Nickerson. I'm a professor in the Center for Infectious Diseases and Vaccinology at the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. So research in my laboratory here is focused on two main things. First of all, we're interested in understanding how space flight alters the infectious disease risk because we want to keep the crew, the astronauts, safe and mitigate their risk for infection when they're flying. But likewise, it turns out through the studies we've done in my laboratory and with Dr. Ott, we have been able to show that there are aspects of that microgravity environment that cells encounter when they're cultured in space light that are directly relevant to what those same microbial pathogens encounter when they're in your body during an infection. Well, it all got started several years ago when Mark Ott at the NASA Johnson Space Center called me up on the phone and said that the astronauts were immunocompromised during space flight. Now that means their immune system doesn't function quite as well as it does when they're down here on Earth on a daily basis. And this intrigued me because my background and career training was in microbial pathogenesis. In other words, I study how microbes cause disease, the cellular and molecular mechanisms that they use to cause disease in your body. By studying those mechanisms, we can then apply that knowledge to develop new vaccines and therapeutics and treatments to prevent you from getting sick from infection. So I realized we knew half of the equation. We knew that space flight altered the immune system, but we didn't know the other half of the equation. And the other half of the equation is also very important to determine whether or not you're going to get sick after you get infected. And that has to do with the virulence of the pathogen. Now virulence means disease-causing potential. But nobody had looked at the effect of space flight on the disease-causing potential. So I immediately asked Dr. Ott, what I thought at the time might be a very silly question, and this should always teach you, always ask questions. No question is ever silly, no question is ever dumb. So I asked him, I said, well, this is amazing. I said, we have to look at the effect of space flight on the infectious disease potential of the pathogen. Has anybody ever done that? And his response was, no, they haven't. So I immediately followed that question was, well, we have to do this. Can we fly an experiment now? That was my naivete because I didn't realize you had to go through a very long series of ground-based studies to validate that you really needed to use the space flight experiment to, to address your potential question. I said, okay, until we can fly, is there some way that we can mimic, some system that we can use to mimic, to culture these bacterial cells here in the laboratory on Earth under conditions which, which mimic space flight? So this is that special bioreactor that NASA design that allows scientists like me to culture our cells in the laboratory under conditions which both simulate aspects of the microgravity environment and simulate aspects of inside our human bodies. So we have been able to use this bioreactor to grow pathogens under conditions in ways that they actually experience in your body, in addition to similar ways in space light, and find new ways that they're causing disease in the body. For example, my laboratory, in collaboration with Dr. Ott's laboratory, has shown that when we culture pathogens in this bioreactor, especially Salmonella, a major human foodborne pathogen, 
it causes disease not only differently, but it globally changes its gene expression profile. It becomes a better pathogen. It can cause disease more effectively. It's a more robust pathogen. And it can also uh, be more resistant to being killed by stresses that your body normally challenges it with. So armed with this information, this new insight we've been able to provide about how salmonella could cause disease in the body by culturing it under spaceflight-like conditions, we were awarded a grant from NASA, our first one, to fly a spaceflight experiment. So this is the experiment we were funded in a grant with NASA to fly. What is the effect of true spaceflight on salmonella gene expression and disease-causing potential or virulence? Now one thing to keep in mind is that spaceflight, doing experiments in spaceflight is very different than doing them here on the bench on Earth. You have to think differently and there's a whole lot of constraints that you're going to have to consider. One of them to think about is we wanted to study the effect of spaceflight on the infectious disease potential of a pathogen. Well, the problem is NASA at the time did not allow anything to be infected in flight. So you could only grow the bacteria up there and activate them and prepare them for the experiment, but the actual infections have to be done back down here. So it's something to keep in mind when you're, when you're designing your experiment. Now that you've heard the background from Dr. Cheryl Nickerson about this project, I'd like you to try to set up the experiment. And what would your hypothesis be? I'd like you to design an experiment that will investigate the effect of spaceflight on the genetic responses and disease-causing potential, or virulence, of Salmonella typhimurium. When designing this experiment, don't forget, proper containment of the experiment needs to be maintained to pose no threat to crew during or after spaceflight. The experiment must be activated in, in spaceflight and coordinated with activation of ground-based controls. Strict timelines must be designed into your experiment to coordinate with the astronaut's schedules. Experimental return to the investigator post-flight must be rapid to ensure sample integrity for analysis on Earth. And as with all spaceflight experiments, try to use very little crew time and minimize the hardware, volume, mass, and power needs. So, the hypothesis of this experiment is that spaceflight will affect gene expression and virulence of Salmonella typhimurium. You were given a series of constraints that you had to give careful consideration to in designing your experiment. Proper containment of the experiment to pose no threat to the crew during spaceflight. Our hardware or the containers that we use to fly this experiment that would actually activate the work in space had to have what we call triple levels of containment so that there were three barriers between the crew who were performing the experiment and them ever having any risk of it coming into contact with it. The experiment has to be activated in spaceflight and coordinated with activation of ground-based controls. My entire team was at the Kennedy Space Flight Center and that's where we prepared the experiment and we prepared two duplicate sets of it. We had two identical sets of our flight hardware and we loaded them at the same exact time with all reagents including our strain of salmonella um, the fixative reagents, which would be for gene expression, and then the growth medium. And everybody was loaded at the same time, and half of that hardware flew, and the other half stayed on the ground. For the timing to activate the experiment, we were linked in real time with the astronauts. So when the astronauts were activating our experiment on orbit, they called down to us. We were in that room at the same time, and we activated and did everything to our controls in that special room at the same time that they did on orbit. Strict timelines must be designed in your experiment to coordinate with the astronaut's schedules. So you have to design a, a spaceflight experiment and your biological system has to be adaptable and, and your experiment can't fail if it's performed a little bit outside of the timeline of what would be ideal. So you have to tell the crew, I want my experiment to be activated at this time, but I can take this much time ahead or behind it. So plus or minus a certain number of hours or minutes that you can allow for your experiment. The experiment is returned to the investigator post-flight. It has to be returned to us very rapidly to ensure two things, sample integrity for Earth and also
that the bacteria are, are not readapting to being back in Earth's gravity. Because we were testing two things. Remember, our, our hypothesis is that space flight affects gene expression and it affects, vir it affects virulence. So two things happen to our samples on orbit and obviously on the ground as well. Half of the samples after the bacteria were activated for growth they grew to a certain period of time, and then the astronauts terminated that half of the experiment. They fixed it with a chemical to preserve the, the, uh, the experiment for gene expression analysis. The other half of the bacteria for virulence, that half of the bacterium, after they were growing, they were brought back live. So as soon as the shuttle landed, we had a, a special requirement for what we call first off which means that after the crew comes off the shuttle, our experiment is unloaded immediately. And then we had to try to use very little crew time. So astronaut time is incredibly valuable, and you don't get very much of it. So you either have to work with hardware that's fully automated, or you have to design your experiment so that the crew has minimal amount of, of time that they have to invest in doing your experiment, although I will say the crew is awesome. The astronauts always want to give extra time to do science. Your experiment has to be designed to minimize hardware volume, minimize mass, and power needs. You need to really minimize the amount of volume that you're sending up in flight, and that can pose a challenge for your downstream analysis of your samples because you have to have enough volume to get enough sample to be analyzed for both gene expression and virulence. You obviously have to minimize mass because size constraints matter. You want to fly sm as small of volumes as possible. And power needs because most of the power has to go to run the shuttle. So we were very fortunate that our experiments could fly just at ambient or room temperature and the bacterial cells would be fine. And we actually had the astronauts performing manually our experiments for us. So we didn't need the hardware to be uh, as much of a power drain to the shuttle. So what did we find from our spaceflight experiment with Salmonella? Well, we found that spaceflight uniquely increased the virulence of this pathogen, and it also globally changed its gene expression profile. And the unique part of the change in gene expression profile is that the genes that were being turned on and off weren't being turned on and off in a manner that would be consistent with Salmonella actually being more virulent, actually being able to cause disease better. So what this taught us is that Salmonella is causing disease in a different manner than we can detect when we grow it conventionally on ground when we fly it at microgravity. So greatly removing the force of gravity unveiled new ways that salmonella is causing disease in our body. So I'm one of those people who knew from day one I was going to be in biology and life sciences. I knew it would be in biomedical research, I just didn't know what end of it. So my entire career training kind of guided me toward that trajectory. So my undergraduate degree was in biology, a master's genetics, PhD in microbiology, postdoc in bacterial pathogenesis. And that's where it really hit me. The infectious disease world is where I was going to go. I had no idea in a million years that I would get the privilege and opportunity to work with NASA and do spaceflight research as a way to help provide new solutions to outpace infectious diseases. But I was very fortunate to have gone to graduate school with Mark Ott. He went to NASA, I took my first lab position in infectious diseases and vaccinology and my first faculty position, and it's just taken off from there. The most important thing you have to have is passion. You find what you're passionate about, you love it, and you live it, and you contribute in that manner to society. In taking a look at a career path to make it to NASA, there are a wide variety of options to get into something like microbiology and microbiology research. A background in microbiology is important. There are a lot of other majors that can do great contributions here. Degrees in biochemistry, immunology, looking at general biology, engineering, all have a way of joining in when we look at the space flight industry. But remember, first and foremost, do what I did. Find something you really, really love to do and then become the best at it. 